Hi everyone. So I'm testing out something new today, which is to offer an audio adjunct to the new excerpt that I've posted from Proof of Corruption, which in this case, uh, this week is the sixth excerpt that Macmillan has published from the book, which comes out on September 8th, and you can pre-order it now. The six excerpts deal with a variety of topics. There are dozens of topics in the book. The six excerpts we have so far deal with COVID-19, China, Turkey, Israel, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and now the new excerpt that's just come out uh, deals with Ukraine. Um, Ukraine is one of the chief topics of the book, largely because the impeachment inquiry that we saw in 2019 and the impeachment trial that we saw in January of 2020 was really the political version of the actual story of what happened between Trump and his aides, allies, agents, associates, and advisors, and Ukrainian nationals. It was essentially the version that would work for TV, that possibly would work as a sort of political narrative. But there is a massive, even epic, I would say, tale to be told about what Trump was actually doing in Ukraine, not just in 2019, but in 2018, in 2017, even going back to during the campaign in 2016. What we saw with the July 2019 Trump Zelensky phone call that the impeachment focused on was literally the very, very tip of a story as large and as complex as the entirety of the Trump-Russia investigation, which, as we know, took Robert Mueller hundreds and hundreds of pages to summarize. And that doesn't even include the counterintelligence components, which, as Mueller said on page 10 of volume one of his report, he had to send to the FBI counterintelligence division. So the full story of the Trump-Russia case uh, would take thousands of pages to describe. I and mean, that's one reason why the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's forthcoming uh, part five report on the Trump-Russia case is a thousand pages long, apparently. That's just one-fifth of the reports that they've done. So if the Trump-Russia story is thousands of pages long um, in its description, perhaps even just a summary, what I'm telling you and what proof of corruption makes the case for across hundreds of pages is that the Trump-Ukraine story is every bit as big. It would take thousands of pages to describe every possible contour. And so it's a strange subject to be doing this excerpt on because the excerpt is six or seven pages from a 576 page book. And it gives you only the barest inclination of what really is a story that begins in 2016. Before the 2016 presidential election, um, the Trump campaign behind the scenes, including Trump, Roger Stone, Michael Flynn, Steve Bannon, Eric Prince, um, the whole team that was focused on national security specifically, Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, were not just very interested in accessing the stolen documents that they believed the Russians had criminally taken from Democratic entities, including the Clinton campaign, even as they were publicly saying, um, particularly Trump, publicly denying that the Russians had done anything at all. They were also discussing who could be blamed instead for what had happened. This wasn't even post-election, though obviously that effort ramped up post-election, but it very much happened pre-election as well. So in the most basic sense, and this isn't really the full story, this is, this is just the summary, the Trump campaign and then the Trump transition and then the Trump uh, presidency and administration has tried to pass four different conspiracy theories uh, about Ukraine intended to exculpate Putin from what he did during the 2016 election, aid Paul Manafort to ensure that he doesn't talk to the feds even post-conviction to get a sentence reduction, um, suggest falsely that there will be tampering on the part of the Ukrainians in an attempt to aid the Democrats in 2020, and to falsely accuse the Ukrainians of doing so in 2016, uh, to imply that crimes were committed by Clinton, to falsely cast aspersions against Joe Biden and his family to try to win the 2020 election through the use of foreign 
national provided disinformation that is entirely false about Joe Biden. It's a massive campaign uh, and it touches on missile sales to Ukraine from the United States. It touches on sales of military equipment from the United States to Ukraine, but not just sales in 2019, also sales in 2018, 2017. Because the simple fact is that the Trump campaign knew by the summer of 2016 that it needed to craft a narrative to counter the Russia narrative, which it knew then and knows now was true, was accurate, and as established by the Mueller report, there was in fact collusion between the Trump campaign and Russian nationals. Whether or not there was a hacking conspiracy, which Mueller could not find evidence beyond a reasonable doubt of, and which frankly Trump critics like me have never even alleged in the first instance. But there was collusion, so a counter-narrative was needed. The four conspiracy theories um, that have been passed by the Trump campaign in 2016, then the transition, then the administration, I refer to as the Burisma conspiracy theory, the Cloud Strike conspiracy, the Black Ledger conspiracy theory, and the uh, Chalupa conspiracy theory, which is simply the last name of someone who has been falsely, entirely falsely accused um, by the Trump administration and Trump allies of being an interme intermediary in DNC Ukraine collusion. The Burisma canard, which is discussed in the excerpt that we just posted, has to do with this idea that somehow Joe Biden stopped an investigation into a Ukrainian company called Burisma that Hunter Biden was connected to. I'm not going to talk too much about this conspiracy theory because the excerpt that we just posted that's atop my Twitter thread um, is part of the just comprehensive debunking of that conspiracy theory that you have in proof of corruption. But secondarily, there was a conspiracy theory called the cloud strike conspiracy theory. And the idea there is that the Clinton campaign essentially faked being hacked uh, and the DNC faked being hacked uh, in mid-2016, that it never happened, that the Russians weren't involved. That also presumably would mean that the Trump campaign didn't do what we now know it did, which was search for Russian hackers who held those documents throughout the summer of 2016. And that in fact, the Clinton materials are being held by a Ukrainian company, which is actually an American company, but Trump calls it a Ukrainian company called CloudStrike. Um, and that the quote unquote servers that were allegedly hacked are in fact being hidden somewhere. Um, there's another section of proof of corruption that again comprehensively dismantles every element of this conspiracy theory. But as you can see, it's an attack against the DNC. It's an attack against Clinton. It's a suggestion that the Democratic Party ran a dramatic hoax against the Trump campaign, which of course is also false. Uh, it suggests that such nefarious conduct might happen again. And it gives Trump an excuse for believing Ukraine to be corrupt. When the reality is that Trump's Ukraine policy beginning in March of 2016, well before the presidential election, was a hostile policy toward Ukraine purely, and I can't emphasize this enough, purely in the interests of pleasing Vladimir Putin. So that must be hidden by Trump as well, now that he's president, but also when he was a candidate, it must be hidden that in fact everything he was doing was to please a country, Russia, that is at war, and many people don't realize this, they are currently at war with Ukraine. The third conspiracy is the Black Ledger conspiracy theory, and that's really focused on attempting to salvage Donald Trump's relationship with Paul Manafort to ensure that Paul Manafort does not cooperate with the feds. As Trump began telling his friends in January of 2018, Paul Manafort is the one person who he thinks really can cause significant damage to him, though what damage that is, he does not specifically say. And so it's been imperative for him for years now, really starting in 2017, to do everything he can do to exculpate Paul Manafort. Yes, it exculpates him, given that Paul Manafort was the focal point for collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia, according to the Mueller report, but it also exculpates Paul Manafort and Donald Trump is interested in doing that because he doesn't want Paul Manafort to sing to the feds about any activities that Trump may have been involved in that Manafort has special access to. And if you've read my books, Proof of Collusion and Proof of Conspiracy, you have some idea of what those activities may be. But essentially, the Black Ledger conspiracy theory says that the evidence that Ukrainian investigators wanted to bring to bear against Paul Manafort for his crimes in Ukraine, which is a ledger of payments that he received, uh, illegal payments that he received according to prosecutors, that that ledger was forged. Now, 
where it gets really complex is who Donald Trump and his allies and agents and advisors and associates say forged that particular document. To be clear, there's no evidence it was forged. That document was actually never even used in the American prosecution of Paul Manafort, but there's no evidence whatsoever that it's in any sense false. But it's important for Trump to say that it is because he argues that it is a Jewish conspiracy. George Soros is apparently behind orchestrating various entities and institutions in Ukraine and across Europe, attempting to frame Paul Manafort in order to hurt Donald Trump. So the Black Ledger conspiracy theory is very, very dark in its contours. Of course, again, entirely false. There's no evidence to support it. But it's fundamentally an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory about George Soros being a puppet master who is attempting to destroy Trump, positioning Trump as essentially battling a global Jewish conspiracy that has Soros at its head, certain powerful Ukrainians uh, and others who, for no apparent reason that Trump can articulate, uh, have decided they're going to move the levers and wheels and cogs of the justice system in multiple countries simply to destroy Trump. And then the final conspiracy theory has to do with Andrea Chalupa, uh, a Democratic consultant who falsely was accused by Trump and his crew of being an intermediary between Ukrainian officials and the DNC and providing information about Paul Manafort to the DNC. This is another complex conspiracy theory dealt with in detail in proof of corruption. Once again, there's no evidence for it. And once again, I'll note that all the Ukrainians allegedly involved have denied it, including some of whom who are neutral towards Donald Trump or even considered allies of Donald Trump. They've denied this as well. Meanwhile, as proof of corruption details, during the 2016 campaign, it's not just that Donald Trump was encouraging openly and publicly the assistance of the Kremlin in his election campaign, but he was receiving endorsements and aid and direct consulting from more than a dozen countries around the world. There's a story to be told about Donald Trump's 2016 foreign national advisors, people who worked directly for foreign leaders, who were parts of foreign governments, who were advising him on foreign policy beginning in 2015. And I'm not just referring to people who were secretly foreign agents like Michael Flynn or Rudy Giuliani. These are actual foreign nationals who were critical parts of Donald Trump's campaign team, separate from the fact that we must also note that Donald Trump was directly and publicly endorsed by leaders around the world, even as he said that a single editorial that was critical of him, written by a Ukrainian official, meant that Hillary Clinton was colluding with the nation of Ukraine. There's a level of insanity in what Donald Trump has done that the impeachment trial didn't touch, and I haven't even gotten into what Donald Trump was really doing with Ukraine besides trying to please Vladimir Putin. And that is, he was trying to, using the levers of the American government and using his power as president, return the Ukrainian energy market, which is essentially a proxy for the entire Ukrainian economy and political establishment, turn it back over to the control of the Kremlin in a historic betrayal of a US ally, an attempt to interfere in the Ukrainian-Russian war and to weaken NATO and aid Russian expansion. I can't really get into the full story here because it took 600, 600 pages in the book, but I hope you will pre-order uh, the book. It comes out in about six, six and a half weeks, and I hope you'll continue to read the excerpts that I post online. Thanks for listening.